Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Thank you. So this is day 10. Some big things to keep in mind is next class, we've got our unit six test. So today you're going to have an opportunity to work in review with a classmate uh, or individually, if you so choose, and prepare for that unit six test. Um, first, let's go ahead and take a look at our bell work. And so there's lots that we can tell about uh, the graph of a parabola just from its quadratic equation. So let's go ahead and take a look at the equations for A, B, and C. Remember the discriminant, remember that special quantity inside the radical, that B squared minus 4AC, tells us about the number and the type of solutions the given quadratic equation has. And so if we calculate B squared minus 4AC when we're in standard form, AX squared plus BX plus C, that'll tell us the number and type of solutions. So if we were to do that for the first parabola found in equation A, we'd evaluate B squared minus four times A times C. We know B squared would give us 64. And then minus four times A would be two, C would be 11. And we could work that out and get negative 24. In the same way, we could evaluate the discriminant for equation B b squared would be 6 squared is 36, minus 4 times a in this case is negative 1, times c in this case is negative 7, and that would give us 8. We can do the same thing for equation c. It looks like b squared, 4 squared is 16, minus 4 times 1, times c is 4, and it looks like we get 0. So let's take a look at how that affects right, the number and type of solutions. Equation A had a discriminant value of negative 24. That means that quantity inside the, the square root in the quadratic formula was negative, indicating that we've got non-real solutions. And so we'd have two non-real solutions. Remember, those include the number i, that imaginary unit, versus equation B with a discriminant of 8. That's an indication that we have two real solutions. Because 8 is not a perfect square, we know that that radical in the quadratic formula is not going to reduce entirely. And so it's two real irrational solutions. Lastly, equation C with a discriminant value of zero indicates that special case where my vertex was right on the x-axis, there is a single real rational solution. So one real rational would be the number and type of solutions. Not only can we tell information about the number and type of solutions, but we can tell whether or not the parabola opens up versus opens down what the y-intercept is without any calculations, simply by looking at my equation in standard form. And then we can calculate the vertex algebraically without the use of the graph, or we don't have to do the second calculate maximum or second calculate minimum, like with projectile motion. We now have a means for doing that algebraically. So let's take a look. In the first equation, we see that our value of a is positive. We know that's a right side up problem, the same orientation as our parent function back from unit one. Versus equation b, we've got a negative leading coefficient on the quadratic term. That means we've got an upside down, opposite orientation. So that'd be upside down parabola. And C again is positive leading coefficient. So C opens up. Now we can go ahead and tell about the y-intercept simply by looking at my value of C. Remember the y-intercept is always, always, always the value of y when x equals zero because it lies upon the y I'm sorry, the y-axis when all x-coordinates are zero. So if we were to plug in zero for x, we can see the value of y is just 11. So for the first equation, it looks like 0, 11 is the y-intercept. Equation b, 0, negative 7 is the y-intercept. And lastly, equation c, 0, comma 4 is the y-intercept. Then let's calculate the vertex. And so for our vertex, recall that the x coordinate is given by that first part of the quadratic formula, the axis of symmetry. x equals the opposite of b over twice the value of a. So for equation a, the opposite of b would be negative 8 over twice the value of a would be 2 times 2. That would reduce to negative 8 fourths, which is negative 2. To get the corresponding y coordinate, once we know an x coordinate, we can simply plug that x value, in this case, negative 2, into my equation A for everywhere I see an X and evaluate to generate the corresponding Y value. We'll then write that as a point X comma Y. So let's see how that works. Negative two into equation A everywhere I see an X. Let's work it out. Negative two squared four times two is eight. Eight plus eight times negative two is negative 16. So negative eight 
plus 11 gets me up to 3. It looks like the vertex for equation A is negative 2, comma, 3. We can do the same process then for equation B and equation C and generate those vertex coordinates as well. Equation B has vertex 3, comma, 2, and equation C has vertex negative 2, comma, 0. Lastly, we can compare the steepness. So let's take a look at these graphs and see how we did. Yes, that's right. A opens up with y-intercept 0, 11 and negative 2, comma, 3. So there we have equation A. Uh, equation B opens upside down. There's our red, there's our red graph. And that looks like it has our two irrational solutions. And then C is the black parabola, and we see that's a special case where we've got one x-intercept, one real rational solution. It's important to note that our first graph, A, whose discriminant value was negative 24, indicating two non-real solutions that included an imaginary component, that number I, there's still two solutions to equation A. It's just that graphically, we can't see them. There's no x-intercepts for equation A, this blue parabola, right? Because they're non-real solutions, they don't show up visually as x-intercepts of the graph. Okay, great work. The steepness factor here on equation A <clears throat> compares with the steepness factor on equation C. It looks like equation C is just a 1x squared dot 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 parabola versus equation A is a 2x squared dot 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 parabola. Just that steepness factor, A, tells me that equation A is going to be twice as steep, right? Its y-coordinates will grow twice as quickly as I move out from the vertex in either direction as that of graph C, which is the same as my parent function. Okay, a nice little follow-up. Let's go ahead and take care of our solving equations. Efficiently worksheet number three. Again, that is homework assignment number nine. We're not going to look at our answers right now. They're still posted up on the rear whiteboard. And so during work time today, uh, that is, you can consult that answer key if there are ones that you're stuck on. But for now, I want to make sure that I get you credit for them. So please give yourself credit at this time in pencil. Out of 18, how many did you do? Write that in pencil as a fraction. Divide, enter, multiply by 4. And then let's box your infinite campus score. Round to the nearest half point, 0 to 4, please. Keep in mind there are no reading questions, so no one should have an infinite campus score of 5. Four is the maximum for assignment number nine. We can pause the recording here and take care of the homework collection and then resume after we've collected the assignment, please. The last thing we want to do is make sure that we have our unit six stamp check. And so we've got bell work days one through 10. That includes today's bell work, which you'll get credit for when I return. Activity stamps, there are five possible. Our day seven, Activity 610, analyzing the solutions of quadratic equations. Stamped eligible items included B8, C8, and D8 for a total of three. Day 9 solving equations activity with factoring. That was last class. That was two stamps. One at the bottom of side one, number four. One at the bottom of side two, number eight. Again, if you completed that, you can still get stamps on that as well. We'll go ahead and get a single total, and we're going to write that on our unit test next class period. So make sure that you find all these stamps, right? And we're gonna include those, and we're gonna write those next to your name on your unit six test, which of course is next class, okay, next class. Now you're gonna have an opportunity to work individually or quietly with one other classmate to complete assignment number 10 from the purple sheet. This is your review assignment. So you're gonna complete all of the page 445 exercises that we've outlined, two through eight, 12 to 15, 17 to 24, and then with the chapter review, the 446 exercises, it's going to be your choice to tailor your review based on your individual strengths and weaknesses. And so what you're going to do is you're going to scan through all the problems. Then you're going to pick at least two problems from each objective, except for objective G, which we didn't address this unit. So you're going to, all the other objectives, pick at least two problems from each objective. Of course, I would do more, but two is a minimum. And don't pick the ones that are easiest or that you can get done most quickly, you want to choose the ones that you need practice with so that you can best prepare for the test. Altogether, this then will be out of 41, and we'll be checking that next time. And we've got all our topics here for the test. These will be posted online. 
as well as the answers to the self-text exercises, which are in the back of all student textbooks. However, the chapter review exercises only the odds are, and so we've got all of them here. I am now flipping through each of these pages so that you could pause as needed, but I will be putting this posted on our Moodle website for day 10. I will export these as part of the notes so that you can then check your answers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I look forward to seeing you next time.